want to do in this talk is really just focus on a couple things that have to do with relating cosmology as a science to uh, going to ph philosophical explanation and eventually a theological explanation. And um, in some sense, in doing this, to establish what I would consider a better framework within which to think about uh, some of the traditional arguments for the existence of God, uh, namely, say, the cosmological argument or the teleological argument. So the outline is I, is I want to talk a little bit about cosmology as a science and its unique significance, um, which Sean has already indicated in some way. And then I want to talk about what some people have come to talk, can consider the cosmological limit. What you might say is the limit of what we can explain in cosmology. And this is really, in some sense, uh, looking at how, as Sean said, in doing anything, we have to make certain assumptions and presuppositions. The question is, how do we justify those assumptions and presuppositions? How do we go beyond where cosmology itself can go as a natural science? And then some little bit of explanation about how I see the difference between scientific and philosophical explanation. And then I'll talk about what is often referred to, at least by a few people, as the inference that makes science, which is called retroduction. It's a hypothetical uh, deductive type of inference that uh, was made famous by uh, Charles Saunders Peirce. And he also referred to it as abduction. And then I want to talk about considering cosmology's questions to philosophy extending retroduction. So, but before doing that, I thought it might be, at least from my point of view and maybe from yours, um, we're talk the title of the conference is God Expl is explanatory, is God explanatory? What are the key issues? And Sean has sort of talked about a lot of those in many different contexts. But I think um, one of the things is just to look at some very simple, straightforward questions. Maybe you won't agree with these questions, but I think that um, it's important to get the questions correct. And um, I won't necessarily answer these questions, but some of what I will say will, um, will indirectly and sometimes directly deal with these questions. What needs explanation? What level of explanation is needed? And the level of explanation, in some sense, is connected with what needs explanation, right? Um, and you can see that in how we do cosmology. And then what are, the dim what are the limits of the different levels of explanation? What cannot be explained without God? Uh, and what Sean is basically saying is that uh, everything we need to explain, we can explain, at least from some points of view, without God. And then the question that Sean also developed in some detail, the different alternatives, what is God? And when you, have, when you answer the question, what is God, then there follows, what and how does that God explain whatever needs explanation? Right? So I don't know if you agree with those questions or not, but I just put those out there to provoke you to think about what you think, what you consider the important questions in this um, whole area. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about cosmology now in a very broad, almost um, metaphysical way. I mean, you're looking at cosmology. I am a cosmologist, but I also have been trained um, in philosophy and in theology, right? And so if I step back and, and ask what is the epistemological significance of cosmology, I think the thing is, is you can use the word universe, and that's a question, what do you mean by the universe? That itself is a difficult question. It's a very ambiguous sort of term, the universe, is the most comprehensive object of science's inquiries. 
within which the existence of all other systems and objects, including life and consciousness, can be most fully understood. And so in some sense, in talking about cosmology, I'm sort of lumping it together, uh, including physics and including all the other natural sciences. Because as I will say in a few minutes, the evolution of the universe itself um, starts from a very simple, hot, dense um, configuration and gradually cools and becomes less dense and becomes more complicated and leads to chemistry, to life, to consciousness. Certainly here on this planet, but also maybe in many other places, right? I mean, there's a whole area of astrobiology um, in which uh, we say, well, there's a possibility that there is a certain amount of life and a certain amount of consciousness elsewhere in this vast and interesting universe. Um, and so in some sense, in cosmology, you're not just looking at the physics, you're also looking at what develops from the physics, the cosmology, the biology, and possibly the consciousness, okay? When we talk about the universe, in a sense, this, this is also a, a term which can have a lot of different meanings. For instance, um, the multiverse, in some sense, can be considered the universe. That we now think, many cosmologists believe, that the multiverse is really the most comprehensive object of science's inquiries. It's not just our universe, right? There's some disagreement about that, about whether the multiverse is actually something that can be included in the natural sciences. Um, and then the idea of universe, you might think of, well, if you have a multiverse, how do you come to understand the existence of that multiverse? How do you come to understand that the multiverse has processes within it which lead to at least one of its many hundreds of millions of trillions of universes, at least one of those giving rise to our universe, right? The, the, the whole question of the existence of that multiverse, okay? So um, what is the most, but from the point of view of the sciences, what are the limits of what science can reveal concerning the, these um, all-embracing systems within which other things um, are understood, okay? And so, as Sean has pointed out and so many other people have pointed out, cosmology has been incredibly successful, particularly in the past 30 or 40 years. And it leads us to recognize that there, not only do we have our observable universe, right, the universe that we observe, but in order to understand in the fuller sense what our observ observable universe, what we can see and detect, and which we will eventually be able to see and can detect, we have to postulate that there's a larger universe as a whole, which may be, as a matter of fact, a multiverse, okay? In order to explain the key characteristics of this observable universe that, uh, that we are able to directly observe and investigate. Now, I think everybody who works in the philosophy of cosmology realizes that cosmology is a very unusual discipline, okay? We only know of one observable universe. There are no other examples for us to study. Um, we can imagine and we can have what I would think would be indirect evidence of other universes, but no direct evidence. Uh, I'll say more about that in a little while. It's connected with retroduction, with this whole idea of, um, of this inference by which we can come to understand scientifically, I would maintain, things that are, that are not directly observable. And then I think that uh, one other thing about cosmology that is unusual is that uh, if you include within cosmology field theory and fundamental particle physics, that uh, cosmology deals with some of the basic features of physical reality. 
And it, it deals with those features like space and time and matter and sort of the overall features um, of the reality, the physical reality that we're involved in, in a, in a way that, some, that reminds us a little bit of philosophy. And um, I think but we can distinguish cosmology from philosophy in a number of ways. And I would sort of ask maybe the philosophers who are here. I'm not a professional philosopher. I'm a cosmologist who dabbles in philosophy and has studied philosophy. But I think there are questions here. It's important to distinguish between scientific explanation and philosophical explanations. And um, I don't want to. I will mention a little bit about theology in a few minutes, but I think it's more important for our particular conference to focus primarily on scientific explanation and philosophical explanation. Cosmology, what, what is the difference? The difference I see is that cosmology and the other natural sciences examines particulars in great detail and with great thoroughness, both quantitatively and qualitatively. It builds very detailed models about how things work and about how the evolution of the universe takes place. And so these particulars, but these particulars in cosmology are universal features of reality. And that's why they, they look a little bit like philosophy. So cosmology is what I would call pervasive in its objects, but unlike philosophy, not in some of the key conditions and features underlying those objects, which they all share. For instance, existence in order, the whole issue of, of explaining um, the basis for the existence and the order that you find in them. Nor, I think, do they, does, uh, does cosmology deal with how we can account for our experience and our knowledge of those objects which cosmology deals with, okay? So this, this difference really implies what has come to be called the cosmological limit. That is beyond where cosmology as a natural science now, using its methods, um, cannot seem to go. That there's a limit to what cosmology can deal with. And this idea of cosmological limit, I suppose, is I was involved a little bit in this, but uh, Ernan McMullen, um, a philosopher of science who was a good friend of mine, and many of you knew him, and um, who passed away about a year ago. And Paul Allen, who is a philosopher, theologian, who did a lot of work, did his doctoral dissertation on Ernan McMullen's thought. Um, this idea of cosmological limit, that cosmology raises further questions which it, which it itself cannot answer. But those questions, at least on the surface, maybe, you know, from what Sean said, maybe they are not legitimate questions, but they certainly seem legitimate. And they have to do with the ultimate origin and destiny of the universe, its meaning, the role of consciousness and mind, the sources of value, a number of other things that the natural sciences, um, although they may presume, natural sciences and doing natural science, you presume a lot of this. You, you presume existence, you presume order, you presume certain values of truth and, uh, and honesty and these sorts of things, but you really don't investigate how, what is the origin of those things themselves? And the very fact that this is the case, I think is represented by the anthropic principle, this fine tuning idea of the universe, that in some sense our fascination, what I would refer to as our fascination and frustration with that reality is a small indication of the fact that there, that there are these further questions that at least on the surface and even when you go down a little bit, cosmology can't, doesn't seem to be able to deal with using the methods of the natural sciences, okay? So what can take us beyond this cosmological limit? 
But before I do that, I want to um, say a little bit more about cosmology and the other disciplines which I mentioned really em cosmology embraces in order to explain the universe. And one of the things that I want to point out is what we refer to as the laws of nature, and um, which has to do with order. It also has to do, at least our experience of the laws of nature, with time. And order and time leads to this whole notion of dynamics. And the fact that um, in cosmology we're dealing with cosmic evolution, you know, how the universe that we know has started, has starts from a state, it doesn't start from a state necessarily, but if we take the earliest state that we have confidence in, the Planck era, and uh, we move time forward, we find that the universe is constantly, um, that the universe is, is going from a hot, smooth, simple state to a cool, lumpy, complex, ever more complex state, okay? And that in some sense, all these types of evolution are connected. Cosmic evolution sets the stage for chemical evolution and chemical evolution for biological evolution and biological evolution for what you might call neural evolution and cultural evolution. And in terms of cosmic evolution, it's pretty clear um, that we need cool, highly structured, complex, and richly differentiated environment for life to be possible. For instance, if there were not, if there were not 92 natural elements, if we just had a universe as it existed before the formation of stars, we would only have three elements, hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium, right? You can't do much chemistry with that. And if you can't do any chemistry with that, then microscopic complexity that is represented by chemistry would be impossible, and it's hard to see how you would get anything like the life that we have. So in all of this, through these different phases of evolution. Cosmic evolution is always going on. And then when you have chemistry, you have chemical evolution. Chemi chemical evolution involves uh, not only the beginning of, of um, chemistry, but also the way in which the complex molecules that form out of the 92 elements um, combine and diversify and um, in their function, in, in their structure, in their function leading to uh, eventually to what we sometimes call instructed chemical evolution where there is actually natural selection in the primitive biological, in pr primitive chemical systems just before the formation of what we call life, okay? So there's all this emergence going on. The central importance in the laws of nature of relationships, combination, differentiation, which I've already mentioned. Here are the four interactions that are at the basis of all this with physics. And when we talk about the laws of nature, what I'm talking about really, when I use the word laws of nature, the term laws of nature, I'm talking about not just the four fundamental forces. I'm talking about all the processes, the relationships, the structures that make reality, physical reality, the way it is, okay? And I like to make a distinction, which a few other philosophers of science have made. Um, I think the one place I've, after I suggested this a number of years ago, uh, I saw that Mario Bungie uh, had said something quite similar in one of his books on, on causality and physics and causality that we have to distinguish you know, our laws of nature from the laws of nature as they actually function. Why, do that, why is that distinction important? Because our laws of nature, by our laws of nature, I mean the laws of nature as we have modeled them and understand, and understand them through physics, chemistry, and other subjects, right? But we all know that our laws of nature, that's been an an evolution of our subjects. Um, and there are lots of things 
that um, there are lots of laws of nature as they actually function that we don't adequate, can't adequately model, right? Um, that we don't know about, right? And there are laws of nature, perhaps, that, uh, that transcend the ability of the natural sciences to deal with. A good example of this, if you are um, from the metaphysical tradition that I am, which is basically uh, metaphysics that is um, or Platonic, Aristotelian, uh, Thomistic, um, the relationship be between the relationship between God and nature, or the, between a creator and nature, however you want to understand creator, that, 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 that relationship would be a law of nature. It would give, in other words, it would be a law of nature as it actually functions if that is correct, if that's a correct thing. Now, of course, it may not be, but if it's whatever gives existence and makes what is possible actually existing um, would be uh, involved in the law of nature, but we may not understand it. And obviously, in physics, there are all sorts of things that we don't adequately understand, right? Uh, we, don't, we really don't have a good, adequate theory of quantum cosmology. There are, are theories that are um, in the wings, so to speak, and are very promising, like superstring theory, um, non-commutative geometry, loop quantum gravity, all those things that you've heard about. How would I define cosmology as a science? Cosmology, I often defined as the physics of the universe treated as a single object of study. Um, not just galaxies or stars, but the whole shebang, as somebody once said. The investigation and modeling of the universe's structure, dynamics, history, and the processes which govern them. And in some sense, uh, not, not only the observable universe, but this universe as a whole, um, that we only have indirect indications, um, embraces, embraces our um, observable universe, which is undoubtedly much smaller than this universe as a whole. And as cosmic evolution occurs, we are constantly getting more access to that larger universe, but still in a very limited way. So the question, there are questions that you can ask in all of this. Well, does cosmology deal with origin? Um, this whole issue of the Big Bang, which I thoroughly agree with Sean about. The Big Bang is not the very beginning of the universe. It's the beginning of where our models are somewhat reliable. Okay. Um, but then there's a whole issue of, well, what do you mean by origin? Um, and certainly, I would say, maintain that cosmology as a science does not deal with the ultimate origin of the universe. Its destiny, what will become of it? Um, we can extrapolate from the physics and the cosmology we have now to predict if everything continues in this way, what the universe will be like in the very, very distant future. After trillions and trillions of years, when um, the universe expands um, to an unrecognizable um, system and where everything, in some sense, um, all the st stellar formation ceases and protons decay and uh, you have just something that is a, a very tenuous a system of expanding, rapidly expanding um, matter and energy. The meaning of the universe, that's another. What does it all mean? Um, Steven Weinberg's particular, often quoted um, little statement that the more he understands about the universe, and Steven Weinberg understands a lot about the universe, says the more pointless it seems, right? which seems to indicate that he doesn't get much meaning out of everything he knows from cosmology. Okay. Um, whether he should or not, well, that's another question. So the natural sciences in general, we might sort of talk about the natural sciences in general in this way, uh, because 
I think this is important to sort of mark down because it helps us recognize what the limits of, of um, science, science, what the limits of science really are. That the natural sciences, as I say here, are disciplines oriented towards a detailed and qualitative or quantitative understanding and modeling of the laws of nature, the regularities, processes, structures, and interrelationships. That's what I call the laws of nature, which characterize reality. Relying on informed hypotheses and rigorous, repeatable analysis and experiment. So if you can't have rigorous, repeatable analysis and experiment, um, then you're sort of, in some sense, beyond where the natural sciences can legitimately um, make conclusions. Um, this is my own particular angle on philosophy. Again, I would invite the philosophers to correct this or to modify it or whatever. But it seems to me that philosophy, philosophy deals with the pervasive aspects of reality and with ultimate questions in our knowledge and articulation of them. These include those features of nature and the universe which are presupposed by the specialized sciences. We talk about what the sciences presuppose. And for instance, I think that I would maintain that the natural sciences always presuppose existence and presuppose some order. And then they go out and try uh, to the best of their ability to model and explain and understand that order of what they find. And then I say here that philosophy in its metaphysical and epistemological functions investigates the conditions of possibility of these features we observe and experience. That is, these features that are presupposed by the specialized sciences. A couple of those features, not just existence and order, but the features like um, you know, cause and effect relationships. You know, the, the very natural idea of what a cause is, what an effect is, and how they are related. The proportionality between um, effects and causes, uh, that we don't expect there to be a tremendous effect from a mosquito uh, interacting with an oil tank, right? Um, so there's that proportionality sort of thing that's there. So there are all the, the questions of what is good and what is bad. What is a value? These are all questions that, um, that are uh, in some sense presupposed by the natural sciences and are, at the, are pervasive in our experience. Okay? I would just say very briefly, I don't want to go into theology. Maybe to start with, well, that theology is faith seeking understanding, the discipline directed towards understanding God if you are using God as the source of divine revelation and the presence and action of God in our world and our response to that transcendent reality. And of course, the, the key um, category that is referred to here is faith. And I would define faith along with Avery Dulles, a well-known theologian, as the positive ongoing response in discernment and commitment to perceive divine revelation. I would emphasize discernment that in, whenever anybody believes, they have to have some at least reasoned justification why they make the commitment to believe, okay? So um, whatever their justification is, whether it's a well-reasoned or well-thought-out justification is another question. This is this famous iconic picture um, that NASA and the WMAP science team developed. And I just want to put this up here for your contemplation because it has to do with what we are talking about um, here. And one of the things that I just like, that in some sense, this, this is the system that we're talking about in cosmology. And not only in cosmology um, as a physical science, but you notice there's the WMAP um, satellite there, right? And I see that WMAP satellite as really summarizing the fact that there's a lot more here than just physics. There's also biology. There's also the fact that um, 
that there is consciousness, intelligence, technology represented by the WMAP satellite, and the fact that um, the people and the species that is operating that satellite is investigating and coming to know this universe, right? So this is not just a question, this symbolizes to me or expresses to me not just the evolution of the universe, but also it expresses to me the fact that we have come, been able to come to know the universe in all its vastness and intricacy, at least to some extent. Not in a fully adequate way, but in an ever more adequate way. But this picture also raises some questions, right? Because if you look at the left-hand side of the picture, you see quantum fluctuations. This is the Planck era. This is what we call the Big Bang. And in some sense, there's a question here about the whole system itself. Cosmology is, in, in some sense, if we really wanted to understand this question from what Sean was talking about, and many cosmologists they talk about, we would really have to situate this observable universe in a multiverse of many, many galaxies, right? That we could only understand at least from an intermediate physical point of view, the existence and emergence of this universe um, from uh, a multiverse or from a pre-Big Bang scenario or from what we often refer, some people refer to as the ekpyrotic scenario where our universe is just one three-dimensional membrane in a much larger dimensional space, say a four, di four spatial dimensional space and our Big Bang happened when two such brains, two three-dimensional structures collided um, and created the Big Bang. That's, that's a scenario that people have talked about. So that, that would be a larger physical system. And um, then that system itself, if you drew it on here, would still beg for some explanation, right? There's still further explanation that at least we would um, develop or further questions we would ask about that much larger system. So these are some of the thoughts that occur to me as we look at this picture on the basis of what I've already presented. So what does take us about uh, beyond the, cos the cosmological limit to philosophy and theology? And so I'd like to talk a little bit, maybe some of you are familiar with this idea. It's really a philosophy of science idea. And it has to do with um, what Erna McMullen talks about, the inference that makes science. In fact, he has a little book of that title published, I think, around 1987, 1988 by uh, Marquette University Press. And um, it's based on uh, Charles Saunders Peirce primarily and it's inference from observed consequence to unobserved or relatively hidden antecedents. And the idea is that using our informed imagination, I want to stress informed imagination. In other words, we know a lot. We are constantly finding out more. And from what we know, we use our informed imagination to construct or invent hypotheses. And those hypotheses really have to are really pointing towards and attempting to explain further questions that we don't yet know about. And in doing that, um, these hypotheses often appeal to hidden realities or relationships or structures or other things that uh, are not, we don't know anything about or cannot directly observe, at least not yet. And then the thing is, is that um, having constructed those hypotheses, we then work out the consequences these have and look for indications of those consequences. And then if we find those consequences, we argue to the existence and operation of those hidden realities that we've hypothesized, okay? Now, obviously, in doing this, there's a lot of back and forth, right? Um, there's a lot of modification of the hypotheses, or even abandoning hypotheses, constructing new hypotheses, fine-tuning these hypotheses as we search and as we probe using these hypotheses in order to, to get further information 
about the reality that uh, surrounds us and that we're part of. Uh, what, what are some of the criteria? Well, as um, Ernan and Paul talk about it, um, that we formulate the hypotheses in order to explain the observed phenomena in greater qualitative and quantitative detail. We then see if these hypotheses work. So it's a pragmatic, Charles Saunders Peirce is a pragmatic American philosopher. Do the hypotheses work? And they work if, and these are some of the criteria that they have pointed out. We are all familiar with them from the sciences. If they account for all relevant data, right? It's what we might call empirical adequacy, right? And not only do they account for all uh, relevant data, but they provide long-term explanatory success and they stimulate further fruitful inquiry, right? So this is what we might call theory fertility, right? So the very fact in the sciences, the fact that, um, that we've built um, that we have internet, that we have um, all sorts of 747s, that we have uh, sophisticated um, objects and technology that are based on quantum theory, and the fact that those work really goes to show how fertile quantum theory has been, right? Um, that we've, that it's stimulated further inquiry and stimulated the development of applications which we could have only dreamt of in our wildest dreams a hundred years ago, okay? Uh, thirdly, it establishes unity with other fields, right? I mean, for instance, you can begin to put other fields together, like uh, Maxwell was able to put the phenomenon of electricity and magnetism together in his electromagnetic theory. Um, and manifest consistency with established theory. So all these in, in, in some way are elements of what we might call or the, would be the, um, the success, and I would say long-term success of, of a group of scientific hypotheses. And so one way of talking about this I've just said it in a way, is that with this long-term success and fruitfulness of a given set of hypotheses and models, there's the growing assurance that something like the content of the theory exists in reality, even though we may not have the capacity to detect those structures or relationships directly, okay? So even though we may not, you know, even though we may not be able to see and the things that are there, uh, see a quark, for instance, we know enough about uh, the, the, the theory is successful enough so that we can at least postulate or have some assurance that there's something like that out there that, uh, that exists. This careful validation of the critical, of critical realist capabilities of cosmology and the other natural sciences provides something else that's very important. And this is one of the things that... Um, that McMullen and Allen and others, that in some sense it's a critical validation, well, it's a critical validation of human rationality, right? That, that using, using this method, we as reasoning beings have um, been successful in uncovering some of the mysteries of our universe and of nature itself. And so this enables us to consider using our, rational, our rationality for successfully probing beyond the cosmological limit that we've just talked about, okay? And so we might think of, of, of using rationality's success as a stimulus for asking questions that go beyond science and for looking for other types of evidence and other methods that will take us beyond what the sciences can do. And, and this, this is what I, I would believe, or I, in some sense, suggest is happening uh, when we do philosophy. That philosophy takes into account, or should take into account, in a relevant and critical way, all that the sciences reveal and conclude to, and yet um, 
be able to look at the questions that science has trouble answering, okay? And find other ways of validating those particular, um, validating its work, its reflections, particularly in terms of looking at the conditions of the possibility for both the existence of those things and conditions of possibility of our knowing and being able to know about them. And what is the basis for this? That um, the basis of this is really the fact that as human beings, when our rationality encounters a limit to our inquiries, our understanding continues to pose further questions. An informed imagination continues to operate. Further hypotheses are ventured and retroduction continues its search for understanding. What falters in this process are the means of the validation at our disposal. I mean, the further hypotheses might be very fanciful or mythological, right? I think that's part of this. Um, but as we critique those, um, our rationality tries to um, find ways of validating what we hypothesize in the philosophical realm. Um, and so we are searching for ways in which philosophical analogs to empirical adequacy and long-term explanatory success and unifying power and consistency can validate these philosophical hypotheses, okay? The key insight, as Paul Allen says, is that rationality is both self-transcendent, it's always going beyond where it is. It's always going beyond where um, and questioning itself and it's heuristic. It's always, you know, setting up frameworks and seeing if those frameworks um, apply, those frameworks that it anticipates what reality may be like. So scientific rationality is retroductive and imaginative and therefore transcendent of science altogether once the cosmological limit is defined. This is another idea, another connected idea that um, is there. Um, or that is mentioned in this context that you might say that from the point of view of the knower, why do, you can ask the question, why does the knower uh, look, or try to transcend the limit, the cosmological limit? And the reason is that there's a surp what seems to be a surplus of existential meaning and intelligibility that is revealed in the operations of scientific inquiry, which invites the knower beyond the cosmological issues to embrace issues like ultimate explanation. And there might be what you might call a, um, a gap, a gap in intelligibility, right? The gap of intelligibility might be answered by further science, right? the gap of intelligibility might be answered by fur further scientific investigation. But the gap in intelligibility might not be able to be answered by further scientific investigation, but requires something beyond the sciences, okay? I would maintain um, that from a philosophical point of view, which in, at least in my way of looking at it, um, goes before a theological point of view. I mean, I think what theology does is theology as faith-seeking understanding is always trying to, um, uses philosophical systems and models um, which have to be established in their own right in interaction with the sciences and other disciplines, uses those to then uh, probe um, revealed, uh, uh, perceived, revealed truth. Um, and so, but I would maintain, as I say here, that, uh, that this sort of idea le is what leads us to think about God as the possibility of God as, cre as creator and destiny. Um, in some sense, I use that as destiny in some sense from the point of view that, in some, that everything goes back to God, 
begins from God and goes back to God, including that God, what, of what that God could be or not be and how that God acts or does not act. And uh, as in the sciences, continual testing, purification, and improvement of the hypotheses is crucial. The question is, how is this done? And I could say more about that now, but there's not time. But I, I, that, that's a, something, a, a particular question I would ask the philosophers. And those, in some sense, all of us are philosophers implicitly. I mean, um, we are always probing and reflecting on our experience of what we know and what we suspect uh, exists, even though we may not know much about it. So um, this is something I've already said, but just to go explanation beyond cosmology. I would maintain, uh, Sean would disagree with me, but I would maintain that cosmology and the natural sciences presuppose that something exists and is ordered and then go out to describe, understand, and model it. Um, but though they can successfully discover the immediate and more remote antecedents of ordered existence, they are incapable of probing the source and the ultimate origin of their existence and order. That's where Sean, I think, would disagree with me. So, and he, may, he may, may be right, I don't know, but I mean, at least from my point of view, this is what I would suspect. And another way of looking at this is that everything we deal with in our experience of reality is conditioned. That is, it's contingent. Contingent in the sense that it depends on something else. And in some sense, even the universe itself depends, seems to de be conditioned. It could be something other than it is. Um, it's not self-explanatory. Uh, or another way of looking at it, there's a, a gap or a further question of intelligibility that is not answered. Um, all of scientific, scientifically accessible reality as a whole is conditioned. In other words, we have no scientific explanation for either its existence or order or why it's there rather than some other universe. It does not and cannot explain itself. So what are the alternatives? Well, the alternatives I won't, would be just to give up and say, well, um, we can't answer that question. But that, that, in some sense, would be an arbitrary, arbitrary termination of the inquiry, right? Um, just stopping the inquiry because we don't know the answer, or stopping the inquiry because we presume that it doesn't have an answer, or that it's a meaningless question. But, it, but many people have indicated that it seems to be a meaningful question. Uh, or to sort of search, as Sean is doing, to search the sciences themselves for an answer, uh, the natural sciences themselves. Um, or, just to, or just to sort of, um, I guess, throw up our hands, which is this basically terminating. So there, you might think of what are the other alternatives. And so all of this raises the issue of creation, what is meant by creation, which is the focus of my talk tomorrow morning. But the main thing I want to do is that I set up this, this particular framework because it seems to me it's a framework which enables us, first of all, to, to recognize um, or to, to reframe issues that are connected with the cosmological and the teleological um, arguments for the existence of God. And also to realize that we're not talking about proof here. We're talking about arguments, and that the arguments have to do with hypotheses that are developed on the basis of um, informed imagination and, um, and hypotheses that, that we then um, try to support by bringing forth evidence which supports those hypotheses. And that's much harder to deal with in philosophy than it is, than it is in science, but I think that's what we're dealing with. So I'd just, just like to end there, and I'm sorry I've taken so long, but I wanted to sort of just put together um, a particular view of how we can move forward connecting uh, the rationality that is successful in cosmology with the rationality um, that we use in philosophy and perhaps in theology. Thank you.